All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with episode number five of Welcome to the Future. And on today's episode, it is titled Going Green. And we have none other than Mr. Steve Cantwell with us of Green Life Productions. Sir, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Good. Everything going well with your day? All good. good? Good, good. Also sitting in with us, we have Mr. Uh, ben Arnett, who is our co-founder and president of FOS. And then also we have Mr. Mike Howard, who is our cultivation liaison here. Um, anything you need to know about growing, doing it the right way and being successful, this is the guy you want to know. Um, in this episode, we'll get more into that. Uh, but starting off, we'll kick it to Steve. Uh, how did you get introduced to uh, cannabis? Let's talk about that first. Let's kick it straight there. Uh, whoa, what, we went there. <laughs> whoa, let's go dude, straight to it. Let's, 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 let's go straight to it. Let's go straight to uh, it. Yeah, I guess as a youth, uh, kids that were older than me and cooler than me, um, smoking weed. Yeah. Uh, see, kind of that story. Yeah. Um, yeah, since I was a teenager. I read around like 12, your first experience where you were introduced kind of to it around that age, right? Yeah, I was around, around 12, I think uh, sixth grade, middle school. So yeah, about 12 years old. Nice. Now, how did it grow from 12 to graduating high school, then UFC? You know, how, did, how does all that connect? Uh, well, I grew up in a small town. Uh, didn't have a whole lot going on. Uh, so cannabis was just one of the funnest things to do, and it made not fun shit to do funner. <laughs> um, <laughs> so no, I just grew, uh, grew up just you know smoking cannabis, doing just small town prom shit, and then I got in a lot of fights. Uh, whenever I wasn't smoking weed, I was always kind of getting in trouble fighting. Uh, got kicked out of high school um, and then moved to Las Vegas uh, where I started training martial arts at 1KX Gym. Um, did that for for a while. And then uh, once that started coming to its end, I quit smoking through that whole period of my life for the most part. Um, and then uh, once that came to an end due to injuries and things like that, I was kind of reintroduced to cannabis and like more as like a medical side of things versus recreational. And then, uh, yeah, I fell back in love with my, my first love, so to speak. And it was, uh, yeah, the rest is kind of falling into place. Now, I read that your wife took you, or she made your first doctor's appointment with the medicinal uh, doctor, correct? That was like the, the transition to the medical use? Yeah, she, uh, it was after my, my last fight I fought in uh, Japan. And uh, yeah, I took a pretty good, end of my career is pretty rough on the injury side. And uh, she didn't want to see me go through it with all the pain pills and go down that road. Uh, so, yeah, she kind of held my hand and, and did all the... Back in the day, like, when you had to get a medical license, it wasn't just, like, go to your doctor like California wasn't. Be like, yeah, I have a sore foot. Give me some weed cards, whatever. No, you had to, like, doctor. get fingerprints and, yeah, and then go to a doctor and then and <coughs> get all this. It, it was insane, the, the, the hoops they made you jump through. Um, and uh, so we, we did the whole thing, and it was one of the first... Um, or not one of the first, but yeah, back in like, was it? Oh my God, it had to be like 10 years ago. Yeah, so whatever the hell 10 years ago, 2017, 2012, 2012, yeah. So it's been a while. When did you guys first come into contact with Green Life Productions? How did you guys get introduced to it? We got introduced to Green Life Productions when he was looking for LEDs to test. He had started as 100% LED out the gate. Um, really kind of one of the first guys you know that was doing it commercially as well especially with living soil um and after four or five years obviously it was just time to look at some new tech and you know fortunately we were both in las vegas and had an opportunity to link up um he tested a couple of our fixtures and you know the, the results spoke for themselves so i'm not sure what was the first strain we grew it was like how much bigger than the it was almost like twice the size of the plant was it the mac it might have been the mac no it was love triangle but love you, triangle. Th you let the part out though uh, i kind of burned you guys a little bit oh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we <laughs> tried yeah we it's tried it like, let's, let's uh, yeah. Back today. so yeah, yeah i forgot about that yeah so, no, i was brought to to a facility and uh they showed me their lights and uh, it, they were very early on. This was like the, the lighting industry was really exploding. And uh, I just, to be honest, I just was like a little nervous because they were a new company and they had all these crazy new ideas. And I was just like a little like, no, nope, pump the brakes. Like I'm not gonna go this direction right now. And then uh, fast forward to about, I think it was like a year and a half later. Yeah, a year and a half later um, after the I was whole Vegas some, cultivation thing. Yeah, I was testing some new lights uh, for our front facility. 
and uh, they see me make a post showing some lights. Um, and anyways, they reached out and uh, we yeah full circle and I tested their light through the light up um, against some other leading um, brand lights and uh, it just smashed everything. Really? It, there wasn't even close. So yeah. you knew in that moment that folks was the light for you. That that yeah, hundred percent. Wow. I was like, oh yeah, this definitely these guys are they're definitely going somewhere. So uh, and at the end of the day, it's not just uh, you really got to know the company because you're not just um, investing in the technology. You really got to make sure there's a good company behind it to that's going to be around um, sure. to to honor that warranty. For sure, uh, in X amount of time, you know. It's true, that's a good point. Like, have a warranty on a product, and you're not even around two months yeah, after. Yeah, okay, how? <laughs> Ten year warranty. They're yeah. out of business in two years. I don't, yeah. I don't, it don't make true. sense, you know. Mm -hmm. How convenient. The warranty lasts ten years. Product is out in four. You're out of business in two. We're stuck. True. Sure. Yeah. yeah, definitely wasn't the motto. But you see it all the time. I mean, there's some companies that I mean, super reputable, but out of nowhere, something hits them hard, and the next thing you know, they can't take care of warranties or. You know, you go to get replace a part or, you know, call someone on the phone and you get a, you know, no signal line or something. So but a typical response, happen. give us an email and we'll someone from our customer service team will reach out to you. But no one reach out. <laughs> no one reaches out or says anything. No, nah, but from the beginning, though, these guys have definitely shown their their true colors and shine, dude, throughout. Um, always helped us. Always been helpful. Um, never left us hanging. Um, so and, and to be honest, we don't have a lot of problems um, with with, uh, with their products. So that's always convenient, too. But any issue we've ever had has always been, you know, taken care of, you know, appropriately. So before we move forward, let's talk about Green Life Productions and the name. Where did you get the name from, Green Life Productions, and you know the origin? Let's let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, the actual name, um, yeah. So it was like, was it like 2017 ish? Uh, no. Anyways, um, we were trying to just come up with something new, something that kind of spoke uh, what we're trying to do. We we're trying to make like my goal was to take like cannabis and use it as like a gateway drug to like more sustainable ways of living. Um, first off, just how to grow plants and how to like, heal the earth with soil and healthy soils. Um, so that's kind of the whole is just green life production, the making of, of, of green life and green being that whole green movement and regenerative. regenerative. So like, that's a regenerative approach to to this is healthier lifestyle. So Green Life Productions um, kind of came to mind. I think my buddy Scott had mentioned a name, uh, Trichome Productions. It was, he was in, he was gonna do something called Trichome Productions. And I liked that, but I didn't wanna rip him off, so I just took the productions part. And right. Green Life, uh, <laughs> uh, so shout out to Scott. <laughs> How has it changed your family? Obviously with you being a UFC fighter, then to now being a full business owner with Green Life, how has life changed a bit? Uh, yeah, life is way different, dude. Um, uh, yeah, from being a professional athlete to to someone who gets to smoke and grow cannabis all day right. is a polar polar fucking opposite, right. dude. Honestly, uh, so uh, but yeah, as far as how my family took it, it's cool. I mean, I don't got no like heavy like crazy religious people in my family, nothing like that. Everybody's pretty. My parents are pretty hippies to the max. Um, they all grew up in like rock bands and and shit like that. So. They smoke GLP. Um, I mean, judging from the success of it, you can't be too mad, right? I mean, <laughs> you kind of have to be a little bit happy. But my, I mean, Things for me, the good. hardest thing wasn't so much my family, but my coaches. My, my coaches from martial arts, they were more reserved, not too cannabis um, friendly. Uh, so kind of that, that was more touchy than actual family members, to be honest. But they're cool. They, they all understand. And again, the, the success kind of speaks for itself. You know, cannabis has helped me out tremendously. Um, they've seen it, so can't argue it. And I mean, once you get into the science, I mean, especially at what we with what we do here at FOS between the science and engineering with LED, outside of just cannabis, it's such a bigger world outside of it just being a controlled substance or whatever you want to call it. You know, however people enjoy it, it has a lot of benefits. Yeah, and, and Steve has actually taken it to the next level and even sponsored athletes and you know nice. MMA and in you know around town too. And I mean, people don't talk about it enough. And obviously, the UFC is kind of you know, fronting that fight for everyone, kind of saying maybe we should let people smoke cannabis as it relates to recovery and, you know, it, is it really a performance enhancing drug or is it something that should be used like, do you want to give Moxycontin or do you want to just smoke some weed? It's like, what are we really doing here? So um, it's pretty fun to see a lot of the sports change, especially with, you know, UFC and MMA kind of kind of leading that, that charge. Now, what are your thoughts on that considering times were a bit different when you were a fighter with UFC and some of their rules and regs with marijuana? What are your thoughts on it now? The guys um, are kind of just free skating, you know, getting to enjoy, go go to fight. I'm sure their bodies feel better. I mean, I'm I'm not hating if, if, if that's what they want to do. I mean, I, I I don't think I would smoke cannabis all that much um, as a professional athlete. Honestly, it just it's it's as as good as it can do. It's also I think it could kind of stifle you a little bit as far as just your 
you want to be hungry. You want to be you want to be uncomfortable. You, if you're a contender, and you're not a champion. You should be uncomfortable um, until you get that belt. Um, uh, you should be hungry. You should be you know all these things. That I feel like cannabis is on a curve. Um, so I, I feel like cannabis would be kind of counterintuitive uh, if you didn't use it. You have to be really strict. Maybe just use it at night for recovery. It'll be very strain specific. Um, but I wouldn't recommend. Uh, it makes you comfortable. You know, like I, I don't even like before train camps. I wouldn't even like hang out my wife too much she, she, she'd baby me and make me, make me too comfortable you know I'm trying to get into that that warrior mentality I, I need to kind of um, enjoy the process the suffering a little bit so I, I feel like cannabis could kind of disrupt that a little bit especially on like younger athletes or younger fighters um, but definitely on the older ones I see it being you know if when used correctly I could see it being beneficial do you have a lot of guys come back and reach out to you to talk about it, like current fighters to kind of talk about your yeah. journey up until this point? Yeah, I, I mean, um, and I, I just rec- I, as far as like cannabis goes, yeah, they're always asking me questions: what strain this, what strain that. I tell them the same thing: like, I, I, it's not going to help you fight better. I wouldn't take it. Like, I wouldn't be smoking too much. But uh, I mean, fighters deal with a lot of shit, and they have a lot of their own issues, so you can't really judge them. You never know what they're going through. For sure. I look at it like whatever it takes to get you to show up. As long as you show up to do the job, granted, I mean, I want you to be your best, but whatever I can do to get you to show up in the best state that I can get you in, at this point, so be it, <laughs> you know? So right, because yeah, you came from from boxing as well. And, yeah, and, and I mean, I, media yeah, for, yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, I get that. I mean, I see how a lot of guys, I mean, during my time in boxing, I would see... I would get a front row seat to kind of how he would look after a fight, you know, in the days after. And that's the part that you don't see, like the beat up, the bloody face, the swollen, you can't walk. So it's kind of good. I actually think it's a great idea that fighters are getting the opportunity to explore additional healing properties um, because the longevity of their body with over the counter drugs and pills is just not long term. It's not sustainable. Not at all. Has that improved like your quality of cannabis or some of the products that you offer considering you think about athletes or you used to be an athlete at all? Yeah, and not just just that I used to be an athlete. Just that I, I got the benefit of starting off in the medical days of the medical program, um, and back then it was it was a really exciting time. People were were super stoked on like all the different sciences as far as terpenes and cannabinoids and this that and all the entourage this and and all these things. It was a really exciting time. And then as soon as it went recreational, like everybody's mindset just completely changed, and it was just like thirty percent, forty percent. That's all they wanted. <laughs> uh, so um, luckily. Uh, as an athlete um, coming from the medical days um, I feel like it definitely like I'll keep some strains um, that really uh, at first glance uh, may not be all that great looking but then if you look over like the terpene profile like oh shit you have you know five milligrams of this some rare terpene that you know no nothing else has so you'll kind of see why it's around but you have to kind of look past that you know 20 percent TC levels or whatever the, the norm is now so, Mike, let me ask you. So, obviously, you deal with a lot of cultivators and um, making sure that they have what they need or that they're in the right position to start off. What would be some of the advice that you give um, cultivators like Steve who may be entering into it from a medicinal standpoint but now going into a recreational, um, you know, scaling their business to be full service and recreational? I mean, cultivators like Steve, I wouldn't give advice. He does what he's right. doing. Uh, <laughs> those, are, those are the guys that you give the lights and you kind of let them run with, right? There's yeah. there's like certain nuances. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you know, you can bounce uh, ideas off each other right. with. But um, yeah, there's certain guys you can just throw lights and, right. and learn something from by watching them do right. what they do in a slightly different way. And right. Steve's a great example of, you know, just someone that you can learn from by watching him do what he does. How instrumental would you say your role is just for people that are making that transition to really wanting to educate themselves as well as grow quality product in, in launching their their um, business? I mean, every facility needs something different, right? So right. sometimes I help out 1%, sometimes it's 0%, sometimes I'm a lot more hands-on. Um, whether it's a new state that goes legal and has kind of new guys adapting for the first time or even growing for the first time, obviously you need to be a little bit more hands-on with them. So, I mean, every facility is a little bit different and it's just trying to figure out that nuance to where you can help them succeed. Got it. Nice. Now, speaking of Ben, let's start here. So obviously they had our false fixtures. What is one of the challenges that you see with getting a new business or an example? Obviously Steve does everything right. So this wouldn't be him. This is hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> Not everything, but he does majority of what he's supposed to write. But for the people that are trying, that are struggling, what's one of the things that you look at that you would advise them with switching over to LED? Um, I mean, I think it's a, it's a multiple part thing. You gotta imagine every time you open up a new market, 
it's those first adapters, those first people with the license, those first people putting plants in the ground, they're going to have a competitive advantage over anyone else as it relates to building their brand, working out any kinks in their system. But at the end of the day, in the next five years, you're going to see a serious rush of people trying to figure out how to reduce the cost per pound right. and how they can grow the most of it and the highest quality of it. I mean, that is the, that is the name of the game, right? So if you got equipment that is down the street growing twice as much as you, for 20% cheaper and they're, you know, flipping faster than you and they have an amazing team that's just like, you know, clockwork. There's a lot of things you have to do. One is equipment and that's not the only success of a grow though. I mean, it's, I mean, it could almost be 50-50. You gotta make sure you have the right equipment but you gotta have the right driver too, you know. Sure. Always going back to car analogies, but you know, a, you know, 2000 horsepower race car isn't anything with a guy who doesn't know how to use it or a girl who doesn't know how to use it. So it's having the right cultivator, the right management team, the right strains. Um, everything that goes along. I mean, you can just look at the cannabis industry. One strain that's hot right now, you'll literally be made fun of and laughed at for growing in 12 months. I mean, that's, so that's how fast this industry changes. So, I mean, it's it's staying on the, the cutting edge, the curve, and which is a very scary spot to be at because you buy one piece of equipment and you're just curious, like, God, is this thing going to be worth anything in a year or two, you know, before the warranty runs out? Is it, am I going to have to buy something new because the guy down the street's got something? So... It's, it's a very interesting, obviously, time for cannabis, but it's a very exciting time because now we have people actually building stuff for commercial cannabis growers, not just saying, yeah, we'll use it for tomatoes. It'll work for you, too. So we're seeing a lot of cool stuff come out and a lot of research being done, and, and we're just excited to be, obviously, a part of that. But, uh, yeah, again, putting your best foot forward and making the right purchases, you know, buy once, right. not twice. Right. So doing it right the first time uh, is huge. And if you can find some people to help you that have done it successfully in other states or the, you know, near the same methodology you're trying to, to uh, copy or, or replicate, um, you know, get those guys on board and take care of them. The, the amount of people that fail because they don't take care of their growers or their team, yeah. it is beyond me. You get a couple of guys that literally think they can just pay a, a OG grower to come in who knows what he's doing, teach two kids, you know, the same thing and then they have one good harvest they'll fire the the og and i'm like oh my god that's that's such a Why? foolish move and then literally two harvests later they're back the, in square one the yeah the rooms the plants look dead the you know the people that, that were trained aren't even showing up and it's like We've yeah. gotten those calls before. Yeah, we've gotten those calls. <laughs> I don't understand the why. Like you get it going the right way. You're, you're, you're making money. You're, you're making, making money and you're happy. Money. Yeah. The data's coming in right. Like you're getting the dream that you want and then it's kind of, you, I mean, do they make it, do they feel that is that easy to sustain without them? Is oh, 100%. It it, it's crazy. I mean, okay. I think everyone in this room has probably seen or been through a scenario like that where you're like, you go to help some guy out, you start helping them and then they try to get out of it because they think they got it figured out. Right. And then six months later, they're, knocking back at your door <laughs> and it's just bonkers and it, it, it's it's pretty crazy to see and i've seen that happen and be the reason a cannabis grow takes a huge dive or isn't as successful uh, more than anything else genetics equipment otherwise is them not being able to or them trying to like screw over a team member or something like that so it's it's bringing the right team on and then compensate them pay them for what they're doing don't be scared to write that check Consistency is key in that. Clearly, you can't. Mm -hmm. that's you can't your integrity. switch operations in that. There's, there's no way that's. Yeah, same. when it comes to cultivation, you're, I mean, that's your integrity. I mean, if you go 25% THC and 4% terps this time, and then the next run you're at, you know, 20 and two, I mean, you can't call that the same strain. That's, that's not even. That's not good for your brand, at least. We talk a lot on this podcast about transparency, and that is something that we pride ourselves on here. I know Steve does with the great product that he offers, and then as well with us at Fos. So, um, before we go any further, let's get into the product that you brought with you, Steve. Let's let's talk about what you bring with us today. Uh, you know, I just try to reach in for something different that ain't been out for too long. Uh, so I got some McLavin um, number nine. We had a couple of phenos floating around. Uh, this was the the winner of them. Uh, it's a nice little head stash. It's not the we didn't think of too much of it. It's not a big yielder. It's not the highest of testers, but she's got some flavor, and she's really nice to, to work with. Um, and then we brought some full melts. I did a uh, grape pie full melt, uh, and we did a, a, a coffee cubed um, full melt. So these are just straight bubble hash, um, okay. not pressed. Okay. Uh, so they'll leave a little grit in the nail, but the flavor is worth it. Okay, good, good, good. Hey, well, we're going to get into them. Let's see. What's the, what's the first one we're going to? Start with here. Uh, well, let's, let's, start with the, let's start with the. Let's start, start with some the flower. Giant. Giant. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So, for our listeners, although you cannot see, if you are interested in watching the podcast right now, go over to fos.com, click the top right tab, and you will see the podcast tab. Click down, and all of the episodes up until this point will be there along with this one. So, you can get into this next segment that we're about to do. We're about to do some testing on some stuff that was brought into us, some goodies. So, 
Let's see how it goes. Let's see what we got. So this is the uh, McLavender. It was a purple cough crossed to um, uh, lavender. That was nice. the male. McLavender, purple. And then it was a uh, crossed to lab, uh, Mac one. So we call it right. a McLavin. Right. Um, nice. That's we, a good we, one. We, and we that was your, that's your in-house breeding program, right? Yeah, we, we nice. have a, a, a tester room with photo slides. You want to say that again, just in case <laughs> people listen? This said it one more time. It's a tester room in all the other rooms. Okay. So, <laughs> so let's do the test you room. You said you have consistent. a tester room with false lights, right? False fixtures? Yes. Awesome. Okay, I just wanted to hear that it's again. A, so. it's a, the, we have the Aries set up of two little dual side-by-sides. They're a seven by eight rooms with a four by four bed in them. Uh, and they're, yeah, they're pretty sweet. They crop out nice. All right, you guys heard that. That wasn't me that said that. That was Mr. Cantwell. So if you need to rewind that back, please do so. But he does no, have false pictures Aries, off Aries his is really, It's a really, really nice light. It's I kind like of the Aries. It's, for it's, sure. it's, especially for like the home grower, it's the absolute. I think it's the perfect light, personally. Yep. Yeah, and Steve's got our A3Is, F1Vs, um, our greenhouse there fixtures. There we go. So the first one you tried from us was the A3i? What was the first one? Or the no, F1V? actually it was the F1V, I believe. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, the F1V was the one that we originally set our records on. To be honest, actually, the F1V has gotten both records, technically. It has the, the first record. Yeah, no, it actually holds a record, actually, over the A3i. Um, believe it or not, actually, uh, it's a love triangle. Um, I had to check, though, because I think we just recently broke that record um, under the A3i with a uh, Miss Peach, or Miss Poison, sorry. Um, Poison Peaches is another good one you guys put out recently, too. Yeah, I crossed it to the Miss X, and now we have Miss Poison coming out. Uh, it was, without a doubt, the best Fina Hunt I've ever had. Really? Yeah. We need one more person. Japs, do you want to complete the circle? Right, do you want yeah. to complete Japs, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's start here. <laughs> Welcome to the future, everybody. This is what the future will consist of. Obviously, as we know, um, we've seen the news and all that, the, the decriminalizing of marijuana in a lot of states. Also, if you guys haven't paid attention to one of our earlier episodes, I think it was episode one where it all began. We made reference to the East Coast, speaking of New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and so on. Um, they will be regulating cannabis, so it will be a huge boom on the East Coast in the near future. Um, but in the meantime, let's talk the first time you remember getting stoned. Mike. Oh man! Boom! <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? Or one of the fondest circle times? Back, I say. Circle if, back. If, if not the first one, since, since it's a while ago, if not the first one, let's say the, your fondest memory of your first time being stoned or high. What would you say, Steve? Uh, it was so similar to guys mentioned earlier. It was a uh, Jamie, <laughs> Jamie Martin was a dude um, I grew up with. Uh, I don't know what the fuck happened to him. Actually, I think I don't, I don't know. Anyway, does. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're out there, he, yeah, if you're out there. <laughs> hit me up, IG. Uh, but no, he. Uh, I went to his house. He he, he had a, a wild ass dad. Let us do anything, and uh, I smoked weed for the first time with him. He was again football player, older than me. Um, but then the cool part was, as I think my parents kind of. They were savvy to what was going on because when I came home, um, that's when they introduced me to Cheech and Chong. So I came home after spending night at my friend's house getting stoned all night. I came home stoned, um, and then they fucking had Cheech and Chong playing. I watched Up and Smoke for the first time. Uh, and, that, and that's what I remember more than actually getting uh, stoned with my friend Jamie was I remember coming home and watching Cheech and Chong with my parents. Was, was that like the first time you felt like, okay, I'm good at home? Like, I'm, I think they're good with me smoking. Was that the first moment that you noticed? Where they I mean, embraced it. They say. they never really disciplined it in a negative way. They, they okay. I mean, so I mean, yeah. I mean, from, I knew it was cool from the beginning. I guess you could say. That's to have a, that would be a great feeling going from sneaking as a kid to walking in the house and then your parents have Cheech and Chong playing. You're like, oh, this is the perfect moment. It makes sense. Right. <laughs> About halfway through the movie, I realized I knew I was stoned. Wasn't watching Cheech and Chong. <laughs> <laughs> like, at like, least okay. you came prepared for Cheech yeah. and Chong. I was like, they had to have known. There's no way this is coincidence. What about you, Ben? Do you recall? I, I do, actually. I was with all my buddies. Like We were like 14 years old. And we went over to my buddy's house, whose parents both worked doubles or whatever. And they really just didn't give a shit. We go to the basement with our skateboards and our oversized DC shoes on. Crack the window, like get Febreze going, and we fucking rolled up the shittiest little joint, and then we had a little chillum, and we smoked some like, <laughs> probably horrible mids back then, and then we went to Taco Bell, and we skateboarded there, and we thought we were like the <laughs> coolest fucking kids, and then went and got another chillum, found an 18-year-old kid to buy it for us at the smoke shop, and then 
Yeah, we were basically all just hard asses. So. <laughs> <laughs> and what age was that, you said? Uh, 14, 14, 14 years okay, old, something like okay, that. Okay. Yeah. Mike, the hot seat is back on you. Do you recall? It was in high school. I'm not sure when it was, like freshman, sophomore year, just with my buddies out of a little chill in a car. I think it was called Gecko or Geico or some shit like that. That's the uh, insurance. Yeah, yeah. I know. That was the name of the piece as well. That's what, I, that's what came back to me. But see, I don't know if I would have smoked something that was named after the insurance. I, I don't know if that was a sign. It had a lizard on it. I mean, it made sense, right? I don't know if that would have been a sign to me. Like, do I need insurance if I partake in this or do I not? Right. Nice. No, I think I just went back home and ate ice cream. I mean, pretty standard. <laughs> standard first time. Wow. Who would ever guess it would be like that? I would say my first, I'm trying to think my first time smoking. Hmm. To my parents, if you're watching this, this is going to be an interesting segment. <laughs> um, let's think on that, huh? I think I was 20. You didn't inhale. You didn't yeah, inhale. No, I think I was like 20. I was. I did everything <laughs> right up until like 20. And it, I, I think I experienced like a hot boxing of a sort in the back seat. And that was the first, I was just sitting back there like. Because the windows, it finally hit like hot box. I was just sitting in the backseat like, I'm going to die. I, did, I didn't smoke anything, but my clothes smelled like it. My hat smelled like it. My bag, everything. And after that, five was that, years. Was that the version in case your parents were watching? No, that was that okay, was literally, okay. that was really what I, no, that was really like, what I didn't happened. Inhale, I didn't even smoke. No, I was because I was, I was the responsible driver usually. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no, no, I was Never. the responsible driver usually. So I didn't drink. I didn't party. I was usually the guy that was like, okay. hey, Leah, are you going to come back and get us at one? Get us at two. So when I was, I was like, all right, I'm not going to be a square. I'm not going to go in the house. Let's hot box. Sat in the back seat, and I was like, oh, shit. Okay. Then I got out, and that was the first time I felt the high, walking on space. That was the first time. After that, I say it was 21 when I moved to college. Okay. So I didn't really know about it. I mean, I had family and friends that used to enjoy and partake, but I was never the one that – I was always the kid in the corner like, mom says don't smoke. Mom says don't smoke. Then here we are later. I mean, I'm smoking on a podcast. Yeah, my mom ground me on my 16th birthday. They caught me smoking weed because someone at work told on me. <laughs> and I had just got my license past flying colors, like 100%. I'm stoked. And she's got this look on her face. And she's like, I'm surprised you could because you weren't stoned. And I was like, I did that after the test. But then you fast forward, like, you know, two decades. And I was like, hmm, pretty funny. Good. Pretty funny. That plant that you got so upset about. My, my, how times change. Yeah. yeah. No, seven, I don't actually have her smoking. Same thing. Really? Yeah, and she goes to, like, Minnesota where it's not legal, and she'll just be, like, ripping her pen in a bar, and I'm like, you know, you can't fucking do that, right? Like, <laughs> they will arrest you. <laughs> she thinks she's so gangster. It's so funny. I'm this like, no, mommy. what do you want to do here? Oh, yeah, it brings bags of edibles everywhere she goes and CBD for though. the dog. Yeah. Even got the grandparents on it. They're, they're fucking loving it. Everyone's, like, super. They have to be super chill. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the whole point. No one Medicine's so good, people take it for the side effects. Like, No one raises their voice. When was the last time you've heard your mom raise her voice since enjoying cannabis? I mean, she's a loud lady, so I mean, it's often, but... <laughs> Out of anger. But it helps. It helps. It helps. She doesn't yell when she's smoking. No. No. That She doesn't? No, no. She, she just starts baking up a bunch of goods or starts trying to like ask about grandbabies or something. She's pretty chill about it. <laughs> No, but she's she's a, she's a nighttime smoker. She can't smoke during the day, but still proud of her. Yeah, for sure. We've come a long way from penalizing and punishment to partaking with your parents. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've come a long way. I mean, that also talks about. I think that also talks about the magic of cannabis because it's it's such an ever, it's such an ongoing narrative that changes. And then once you add in the science and you add in the engineering behind it, it's it's a whole different ball game. You know, it's a respectable thing. Um, People have to be knowledgeable to run a successful. Facility. You can tap out. Yeah. You can tap out. For me, I know. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm partaking, is, so I don't want to tap out. I can't. We got three more on the way, so I mean, keep it going. Yeah, keep it going. <laughs> so, so yeah, as you see this one, I don't know if you guys can see the size, right? But when Mike, early, when earlier Mike said he grows the fat ones, he builds the fat ones. Oh no, that was Cantwell's. That's Cantwell's. Mine are like three of mine equal that now, so we're just I'll just light them all up together. Try to keep them going. <laughs> Bam. Pass the torch. So here we are. It's 2022, Steve. Um, what do you see for Green Life Productions? What What do you see for the next 10 years? <sighs> um, you know, I just live in the now. You know, I'm, just, I'm, I'm over kind of trying to forecast and, and I 
I've had a million tire kickers, um, corporate tire kickers over the years. Uh, I've had a million, got excited a million times for a million reasons. Now I'm just enjoying what I have, uh, making the most of it. Uh, we started a farm this year, um, so we're growing produce now. Um, we see that as a as, as, as another cash crop, if you will, that's less regulated, a little easier to grow. Um, so we're doing that right now, a good way to kind of keep get back to the community. Um, and just doing my thing, man, just chilling. Uh, not rushing anything. Uh, as far as 10-year plan goes, in 10 years, uh, I just want to be happy as shit, dude, at the end of the day, you know? That's my, my goal. Yeah. That should be the goal, right? Farming and fishing. That's how you keep Steve happy. <laughs> <laughs> do you see your life fully, do you see yourself fully uh, giving into the farmer life at some point? Uh, I'm, I'm more like the, this shit's all going to fucking come raining down eventually, and I want to be self-sustainable side of things, you know? Um uh, to a point, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm totally all part of it. I've been I've always been into uh, animals and gardening and and plants. I, I grew cannabis before I ever smoked it. Um, so like f for me, like yeah, I'm just all about it. Just where do I have the time to spend? Um, I don't have you know time to go full time farmer Steve and and go this off grid regenerative lifestyle like I, I would like to one day do. But right now I'm just trying to you know get there. Well, like you said, that could be included in a part of the happiness, you know some point when you're ready to lay it down all right the cows are calling i gotta go <laughs> gotta just, go out back i'm just enjoying the process for sure. at the end of the day we'll for see sure. where it goes love that what about you mike what do you see next 10 years for cultivators um for how the industry is growing and booming what do you see man it's hard to predict uh, how dialed in everything's getting yeah. is awesome yeah i mean it's cool to see things functioning on such a narrow window now yeah uh growers yields the quality it's all going up and all this new tech coming in is awesome. There's a lot of it and it's cool, but uh, you got to filter it out too, right? There's a lot of noise out there as well. So where I see it going, it's really hard to predict. Um, yeah, we'll just see where it takes us. What would you like to see from the industry considering you have such a, a monumental hand in cultivators and the success of their business? What would you like to see? Oh, that's deep. More grower, more grower owned Love that. operations. Yeah. Uh, I think that translates well. Um, the product is always good. Um, Part of the secret sauce for sure. It 100% is. I mean, it, it's, you see the plants, you see the quality of the flower and most grower owned facilities are, are banging out some amazing products. So. What hinders that? What, what stops that from happening? just the entry to the market. I mean, a lot of times it's harder for people who've been doing this to get into the market now with how the laws are structured. It's Politics. harder for, yeah, there's Greed. so much that so people that want to throw the grower on the cap table. They don't want to give them equity. They don't make an equity pool part of the, the employment program or something like that. So there's an easy way to get a grower to kick ass and you tie it straight performance. Yeah, we're keeping them a part of the company growers. and then tell them it gets paid on per pound or THC percentages, find a way to make it performance based and watch how good that product is. Can give your growers equity, all right? <laughs> That's right. what I'm saying. Right. Historically, farmers always get fucked. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's translated into cannabis too. I mean, and it's more or less than just even giving them equity or, or giving them all the money. It's just giving them a respectable job with good hours and just consistent work because um, they can't even get that half of them. You know, most I mean, really just respecting them for their contributions because they're a lot, they're way more important than the respect level would give off to be, you know? Like you just think they're a throwaway employee, but they're literally the operations of the, they fund the operation with product, you know? Now I have the, uh, I would say 90%, well, all of my managers uh, have been there from the day we opened pretty much within the first, like, yeah. Um, my two growers, um, my, my, my trim room manager, office manager, they've all been there for seven years now. So we definitely respect our employees. It's definitely a part of the program. Mm -hmm. When I get paid, they get paid. Nice. What about you, Ben? I know you see it from all sides. You see it from investor side. You see it from regulation side and, and markets that are on the horizon of, <clears throat> of crossing over. And you also see it from technology with LED engineering and science and stuff. How do you, what are your thoughts? What would you like to see? And then what do you see for the industry? Yeah, it's just kind of interesting to see each state roll out differently. Um, I think Obviously, seeing the uh, the amount of data collected now compared in the beginning, where it was you know to get someone to give you their yield, even like weights, it was like coffee stain papers, and now we have elaborate spreadsheets and equipment that actually can track your data from. I mean, 
every five seconds to every 50 minutes, whatever you want. I think that that's pretty cool seeing the technology um, emerge that's actually built for this this industry. Um, seeing some of the big operators come into place and then seeing some of the craft guys, like some of the best stuff I've ever seen is, I mean, we got guys that are, we've seen their product and where we go on their farm and it's, I mean, it is out of this world. I mean, it is completely bonkers. So again, kind of like what Mike said, seeing more of the grower owned or, you know, grower, where the grower has some equity in the, in the operation. Um, if you want to be competitive, I think that's an easy way to do it. Um, where you have these markets like Oklahoma, where you've got 3000 cultivators, um, I mean, I think it's kind of shown us what that'll do to the price per pound in an area like that. And I mean, it almost makes it unfair for people who aren't, you know, set capital wise. So there's, there's just a bunch of things that I think are going to have to happen um, as we roll out federally and we see what that looks like. But I mean, as, as it relates to what I'd like to see, um, I don't know. I'd like to see federal uh, legalization so we can kind of see what that looks like um, and make sure that we're still testing. Like I think Michigan does a great job, Nevada where they limit the licenses, but I mean, the quality coming out of those places is phenomenal and their market's still looking super strong. So maybe just taking a couple tips from the states that are doing it right. And, you know, let's, let's fucking legalize this thing. Let's do it. Let's do it right. Hopefully the East coast, I know they, I mentioned that earlier and we talked about it again in the first episode, but I know the East coast is getting close. So I would love to see how that changes once New York once New York legalizes it, it's yeah, over. It's, it's, it's massive. It's, yeah, New York <laughs> like and Florida are going to be so much fun to play in. Those those will be two really fun markets to, to watch because I think those will be like California almost where they kind of like you get to see really what people are feeling. For sure. And I think in tourism will increase because, I mean, now everyone has to go to L.A. to smoke because you think you think weed, L.A., but now it's completely different thinking East Coast, New York, Times Square smoking. It's not. It'll be a complete mind change for everybody. You know, that'll be massive for sure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you see, the conversation has slowed down just a tad <laughs> because we all have enjoyed. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of this episode and a little bit of this smoking segment. Um, Mr. Cantwell is someone to definitely follow. Um, Steve, for those that want to learn more about you, where can they follow you? Where can they get more information? Uh, yeah, I guess Instagram is probably the best bet. Um, got a, a Greenlight Productions. Got spelled all the way out to the S because um, we've been shadow banned for like ever. Uh, but Fix that Instagram. We will tag you, please. Good place to start. For sure. Okay. Then I know the website is, to make sure I'm quoting this right when they want to get the full info, it is greenlifeproductions.greenlifeproductions.com. NV.com. Again, that's Green Life Productions NV.com. Again, on Instagram, you can follow him at Green Life Productions, all the way spelled out with an S because they are shadow banned. So make sure you spell it all the way out. Um, we have episode six coming next week. And um, Mr. Cantwell, it's been a pleasure having you. Ben, it's always good. Mike, it's always good. Look forward to seeing Mike more. You know, we'll have to get him on camera. So please, if you, you guys can, can if you can, <laughs> if you find him, <laughs> tag him. Make sure you find him online. Um, he's definitely a genius in what he does as well. Uh, he needs to be heard way more. And, of course, you know the man with the plan, Mr. Ben Arnett. You can never lose when talking to him. I'm Leo. This is, again, Welcome to the Future. Thank you guys for watching. And uh, we're going to smoke some more, so stick around.